everyone uh, good evening and good afternoon welcome to the session of financial modeling training uh, this is an initiative by cfa society pakistan to prepare participants for cfa institute research challenge 2023 2024 and uh, my name is tala amir khan and i will be your trainer for this session so let's get started So here is the agenda for today's session. Uh, the session is going to be two hours precisely. Uh, and considering the scope of this workshop, I have divided uh, the uh, workshop into into two parts. The part one is quite basic, and in which we understand how to build a basic financial model from scratch. And during the workshop, we will build a model uh, started off with three statement financial and followed by a DCF valuation. And the part two, it bit more in advance. And in the part two of our session, we'll talk about the operating model of a textile company. Uh, we will focus revenue and expense, revenue and expenses of a textile company itself. And we will see what kind of basic assumptions we can take considering the current uh, economic environment uh, globally and locally. First thing first, here are the few ground rules that we need to abide by. Uh, first, everyone must have a separate laptop or a tablet. And uh, I strongly recommend each one of you to follow the proceedings and develop your own uh, model in your systems as we move on with this workshop. It really helps you understand the fundamentals of financial modeling. Second is related to using Windows operating system since I will be performing or doing the financial modeling on Microsoft Excel on Windows operating system. Therefore, those who are using iOS or Mac operating system uh, should consult to the Excel shortcut document, which uh, Javeria is sharing it right now in your chat box. Javeria, can you help me sharing the Excel shortcut document in the chat box so everyone can have access to uh, the yeah. document? Thanks. The third one is related to using keyboard uh, only. So again, it is one of the Excel best practices internationally that you should be using your keyboard only while working on Microsoft Excel, building your financial model. And in this regard, Alt key and Control key will be your best friends uh, to explore more features of Excel. And ultimately, it helps you uh, doing your financial modeling more efficiently and effectively at the same time. Uh, and the last but not the least is regarding uh, asking questions. Uh, uh, you are highly encouraged to unmute yourself and ask questions directly rather than writing in the chat box, which is not a preferred way of communication as far as this workshop is concerned. And uh, I have allocated certain uh, uh, time during the workshop uh, to take your questions and that will be at the end of part one and part two respectively. A uh, few more ground rules. Uh, all participants will be muted for the for the entire session unless you are asking questions. And all participants are also requested to keep their videos turned off. Uh, participants will be asked to raise their hands to ask questions. So whenever you have questions during the allocated time of Q&A, you should raise your hand and then Javier will help us uh, identify uh, the, the, the person in the queue uh, to take questions. Uh, the session will be recorded and the recording will be Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, so moving on to the first part of our uh, financial modeling session, which is how to build a basic financial model. But before we go on and uh, uh, go on into the excellent build a model from scratch, let's talk about uh, financial modeling. Excel best practices and evaluation methodology that we are going to use. First, what is financial modeling? The, when we heard the term financial modeling, the first thing comes into our mind is to do the forecasting. 
right we also uh, in, in this financial modeling we also do the valuation to determine the target price of the company on which we are working uh, but for me it really it is basically a tool which helps making an investment decision or investment recommendation so uh, think about financial modeling as a tool which really helps you as an analyst to make an investment decision uh, and uh, the, the the more effectively you use this tool uh, the more sound your investment decision would be the financial model really recreates an actual business model on the spreadsheet and it really simplifies the complex business model uh, uh, of, of of the company itself a few basic guidelines about the financial modeling so again you uh, the first thing that you need to remember is the 8020 rule uh, so there are many things when you start building the model there are many things that you need to focus on uh, you know uh, if you look at the balance sheet or the income statement of any listed company you will see are quite a lot of items that you need to focus but you need to be very much aware of the fact that 8020 rule applies uh, very significantly in financial modeling because 20% of the item in your uh, uh, financial statement drive 80% of your valuation so you need to focus more on those material critical items which drives the 80% of your valuation and later we will see when we do the textile company uh, case study that how critical it is for us to focus to focus more on the critical heads only rather than uh, doing all sort of uh, forecasting and focusing on immaterial item on the on the financial statement the third and the, the second and the third uh, guideline is basically related to the financial model uh, and its best practices again the simpler the better and organized is better what does it mean it means that the model should be simple it should not be complex and it should be well organized because your model is some is, is, is something which is which will be reviewed by your bosses will be reviewed by your faculty advisor uh, your mentor you know so that the model should be uh, simple so that everyone can uh, break through it and should be well organized so that everyone can understand how the things are being linked in your model and what could be your uh, what is your assumption and how the outputs are uh, behaving with regards to those input assumptions but the, the fourth one is quite critical your uh, because the model is as good as your research so the, the better you research about your uh, company or the sector uh, uh, the, the 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 better would be your model in terms of the assumptions so it is highly recommended to understand your company know more about your company and how the the business model works for your company helps you making the more sound financial model and which which will eventually help you making the sound investment recommendation um, the second last is related to market sizing the generally uh, again one of the market best practices is to do the top down approach so whenever you do the financial modeling it is better you do the market sizing but first start the market and the industry in which your company operates uh, and once you understand the market better then you would be able to understand the company and do the financial modeling uh, let's discuss few things about the excel best practices uh, so while working on the financial model you need to be aware of the color coding scheme um, your cell should be should have a font color black if your cell contains uh, the calculation or the formulas your cell should be color coded font color blue if you have any punched in numbers or input numbers and generally historical financials and assumptions are uh, punched in numbers and your financial model should have uh, should be color coded green for those cells which are linked with the different sheets and later in, in, in during our case study we will see how uh, these color coding schemes helps you make your model more interactive for any reader uh, the, the 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 second excel best practice is regarding inputs uh, in your uh, cell so if you can see in the example uh, in front of your screen the first example it has a number directly inserted in the formula like the cell g3 has a number 19.7 percent inserted, which is of course the projected growth rate. The ideal way is to have a separate low, uh, row item where where you have a projected growth rate, and then you can link it to forecast the revenue for the year 2009. 
The third one is related to uh, the inputs again, and uh, this is regarding uh, make your uh, model more dynamic. You should input your uh, 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 input your assumption once only, so that whenever you want to want to make changes into your assumption, you you should be making changes only in one cell, and your uh, uh, model will be more dynamic, and you'll see the output directly. Uh, again, as we discussed in our previous slide. Uh, you need to make a habit of using uh, keyboard shortcuts uh, to navigate uh, through your Excel sheets within your financial model. And again, the use of Alt key and the Control key helps you exploring exploring those features of uh, Excel. Um, the last but not the least is related to hiding rows and columns. And uh, I can see uh, we have a habit of you know doing extra calculation in our financial model, and we tend to hide those extra. Uh, rows in our financial model. So preferably what you, you should do is to uh, explore the feature of group and ungroup, which, which is there in your Excel uh, file. You should be, if you really want to hide certain calculation in your model, which is uh, which could be your extra working, then you should ungroup uh, or group feature uh, rather than hiding those in columns. Here's the key Excel shortcuts. So I'm not going through the entire uh, list of Excel shortcuts. And uh, I have also provided you the document. And Javeria, I'll ask you again to share the same document because a few of the participants just uh, joined in, joined in uh, right now so that everyone can have access to that Excel shortcut document. And again, the more you practice those Excel shortcut document, the better you uh, will be able to use all while working on Excel document and uh, uh, building the financial model. Uh, and the, the key Excel shortcuts uh, is in front of your screen. Again, the F2 feature helps you go into the particular cell uh, to make changes into. Uh, similarly, uh, cut, copy, paste, be all aware of, the, aware of the fact that Control X, Control C, and Control B. Paste spatial is the feature that we are going to use so often uh, in our uh, financial modeling uh, exercise. Again, if you want to increase decimals and decrease decimals, uh, Alt H0 and Alt H9 is the uh, shortcut available in Excel. And if you want to move from one sheet to another sheet, Control Page Up and Page Down will help you doing that. Uh, and if you want to copy your formula downward, and if you want to copy your formula towards right, or you want to fill right or you want to fill down, what you need to do, you, you need to press Control D and Control R respectively. Uh, and if you want to do some formatting in your selected cells, then what uh, the, 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 the shortcut that is available in Excel is Control 1. And uh, later in our uh, case study, we will explore all these shortcuts and we will see how, how useful these shortcuts to save your time and work more efficiently while working on a financial model. Uh, and if you want to select the entire row, you can press shift space bar. And if you want to select the entire column, you can uh, use control space bar uh, feature shortcut available in Excel. Uh, so here's the financial modeling steps that we are going to follow. Uh, the step starts with uh, historical data. The first thing that you need to come up with is to have is to, is to punch the historical numbers in your Excel file. And once you punch all those historical numbers, it could be last five years, less, last 10 year data, uh, you will have a fair idea about the assumption and the driver that you are going to insert in your financial model. And after, after, after coming up with your own assumptions and uh, uh, the revenue or the income drivers for your financial model, you can start building your income statement. And uh, you you can start with your revenue and uh, and you can forecast down to EBITDA. And once you uh, come once you forecast your EBITDA, you move on to the supporting schedule part of your financial model. And here start and here comes the um, uh, the working capital schedule, the capital asset schedule, and the capital structure schedule. And after completing all three schedules, you would be able to complete your income statement and balance sheet. And after completing your income statement balance sheet, you can complete the cash flow statement, uh, and to, uh, which will eventually help you out doing the valuation. So the valuation methodology 
uh, let's talk about the valuation methodology first, and then later we'll see what the valuation methodology we will use for our case study. Uh, so they are primarily primarily there are three broader valuation methodology uh, uh, available. First is POS approach. The, the 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 second is market approach. The third one is discounted cash flow approach. Uh, the, uh, the second and the third one is the uh, are the one which are being used uh, more uh, uh, more frequently in the industry. And the market approach is basically the approach where uh, you use the market multiples and the precedent transaction multiples. And the discounted cash flow approach is the approach where you uh, basically dis where you forecast the future cash flows and discount it at a particular discounted related to your uh, uh, cost of equity or the weighted average cost of capital. So if you talk about uh, uh, a bit more in uh, detail about the market approach and the discounted cash flow approach. So in the market approach, we use equity and EV multiples, and there are quite a lot of market multiples available. And but but it depends in which sector you are working. Uh, if you are uh, working for a manufacturing company, then EV to sales, EV to EBIT, uh, EV to EBIT price to earning are more relevant. And but if you are working for a uh, working on a financial institution or working uh, on a bank, then price to book ratio is more relevant uh, for you to do the market approach valuation. And if you talk about the discounted cash flow methodology. Uh, you need to, as we discussed earlier, that we need to forecast the cash flows of the company and then calculate the terminal value. And there are two different approaches available to forecast the uh, cash flow of the company. The first is free cash flows to the firm, and the other one is free cash flows to the equity. Uh, then here is the quick uh, set of formulas and the ratios that we are going to use for our uh, financial modeling exercise. And uh, here we have, uh, the first we have is a working capital formulas. And uh, uh, later you will see that how uh, we can you know, forecast the working capital. So, so these are the formula that we are going to use. And on the right side of the screen, you can see the valuation formula that we are going to use when we do the key cash flow based valuations. Uh, and we will consult this slide later when we build our own financial model and do the valuation. So before we move on to the part two, let's uh, get started towards the uh, to, to to start building the model and uh, uh, into the Excel. So I'll ask uh, Javeria to share the Excel sheet, which has the historical numbers, so that everyone can access to uh, the document. Let me share my screen again, uh, so that we have uh, Excel sheet in front of. Uh, the screen for everyone's convenience. So here's the Excel sheet probably you must have received in your chat box and Javeria has shared it already. So here's the historical financial that has been given to us uh, of a company named private company IMZ and all these numbers are in dollars thousand dollars and what we need to do we need to uh, build a uh, three statement financial model and do the valuation so let's get started the, so this is a brand new excel sheet in front of your screen and uh, what i normally do is to select the entire sheet by press alt uh, by press control a and change the font to arial so i normally prefer arial font uh, for financial model, uh, model exercise and change the font size to 10. Uh, I'll increase the zoom so that everyone can have a clear view. I reduce uh, the size of the first column and start with the second column, uh, with the first row, and I will write the name of the company, which is Private Company IMC. Uh, the, the second row is basically the name of uh, the file itself. So it's the financial model. So I call it financial model. And the third row is basically tells you the name of the sheet. So the sheet would be the financial statement. So I'll uh, write financial statement. I, I will change the name of uh, the sheet as FinStat 
full form of uh, the, the shorter form of financial statement. Uh, row four would be my header. Uh, so I'll select the entire uh, range of cells and change uh, and, and change the color theme to blue, for example. So I'll change it to blue and change the font color to white. Control B uh, for bold. Uh, and I press Alt H F C for font color and choose white font color. So at the very top, uh, we will have years. So since the data given to us starts with 2018, so we will have first year as 2018. And you can see there is a comma uh, already there. So I want to remove this uh, comma because these are years, not numbers. So I'll press Control 1. Here the dialog box appears and I'll select the... Uh, press Control 1. I go to the number and then uncheck this separated uh, comma. So now I have the 2018 written with no comma as this is a year. I press Alt H A C to center a line and then uh, add one to uh, have year 2019. Uh, do the same formatting by pressing Control R. R so there is the R R And uh, and just to and just to use again the one of the Excel shortcut is uh, basically Control R, and you can see uh, I have the number of years written at the very top using the Control R feature of uh, Excel to copy the formula towards right. Uh, since we know that 2018, 2019, 2022, 2021, uh, 2021, 2022 are the historical numbers, so I want to have. Uh, I want to write A right next to these years. So I again press Control 1, go to Custom, and I write A in front of 0, right next to 0, such that I have A written to it so that so that everyone uh, will be aware of the fact that these are the actual number or the historical numbers. And for these forecasted years, I'll again do the same, I'll repeat the same process by selecting the entire range of cells press control one, this dialog box appear, and then uh, uh, go to custom and then uh, write F right next to zero. Uh, so that it have uh, F written next to these numbers. The first the first section we will have in our financial model is assumptions. So let's have a color uh, as header and control B to bold and then use and write assumptions to have these uh, to have the assumption section, and then uh, the uh, and the next section we have is the income statement. So I copy the same thing to preserve the formatting and write income statement. Uh, so for for assumption section, we'll keep we will keep it as it is. But for the income statement, we have this data, and uh, you can see we are given with revenues, cost of goods sold. So let's write revenue over here, revenue over here. And less box, uh, which will give us gross profit. And we will copy the data. So we have uh, revenue, we'll select the entire range, press Control C, go back to my model and press Alt H B S for pay special and select values and press OK. So for gross profit, uh, I, I sum it up. I sum the revenue and cost of goods sold, and, uh, and select the entire range and press Control R to copy it towards right and do some sort of formatting again. So now we have gross profit uh, copied. The next item we have is salaries and benefit and rent and overhead. So let's copy this and paste it over here, and we will do again the pay special feature so that the entire formatting is preserved. Let's write less for all the expenses so that everyone is aware that these are the number which are being minus, which are being subtracted. And again, uh, for the numbers, we will go back to my data sheet, select the, the entire range of cells where we have salaries and benefits, rent and overhead, control C, and go back to my financial model and press Alt H V S uh, to copy these numbers. And by subtracting salaries benefits, 
and rent and overhead, we will calculate uh, uh, EBITDA, which is earning before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. So let's write EBITDA and insert the submission formula and select the entire range, press OK. Now we can uh, copy the same formula for the entire range of uh, next 10 years by pressing Ctrl R. Select the entire range, press Ctrl B and press Alt H B B for top border. Uh, <clears throat> here we calculated the EBITDA using the historical numbers. The next uh, data set which is given to us is depreciation and amortization. So let's copy it, paste it over here as values. And uh, for the uh, depreciation and amortization, we have uh, uh, data for the for the past five years. We'll copy it and paste it as values in my financial model. And after subtracting a depreciation and amortization from EBITDA, we will calculate EBIT. Again, use the submission formula by selecting the entire range and press Ctrl R to copy the same thing towards right. Ctrl B for bold and Alt H B P for top border. Uh, continuing the process, the next thing we have is interest. So let's have interest and taxes copied together. Uh, in my pencil, paste it as values. And for interest, we have uh, the numbers, and for taxes, we have the numbers for the last five years. We press Control C for uh, uh, to copy and paste it over here as paste as values using paste special feature by pressing Alt H B S and paste as values. We'll insert rows so that we can calculate EBT, which is interest before, uh, earning before taxes, and using the submission formula and select the entire range of cells, and then press Control R uh, to copy the formula towards right. Control B to bold and Alt H B P for top order. Now we have taxes, uh, and after uh, deducting taxes from EBT, we can calculate net income. And using the same submission formula again, and pressing Control R to copy the same formula towards right, and press Control B to bold and Alt H B P for top order. Uh, you can see that while importing or exporting numbers from one sheet to the other, uh, we are calculating our own uh, net income, EBT, EBIT, EBITDA, because we want to make sure that my model is linked properly and give me the same results as the data is giving. Like if, if I want to see whether my net income is being calculated correctly or not, you can see in 2022, the net income is 28227. And we have the same number over here for point two, uh, two eight double two seven. Before we move on to the balance sheet part of our financial model, let freeze the cell by pressing or uh, by pressing all WFF to freeze it to freeze the top border. And then move on to the balance sheet. For the balance sheet, I'll use the same tab by pressing Control C and Control uh, B over here. Control B and write balance sheet. And uh, the, the, the column E should have the unit. So let's have the unit written as well. And in the unit section, what we will do, we write USD 1000. So that everyone who is uh, viewing my model should be aware of the fact that these are in dollars uh, with a unit 1000. Uh, I'll copy it uh, for every row item, paste as values. By pressing Alt H V S for paste special and select values to copy it as values. Moving on to the balance sheet part of it. So what we have in the balance sheet, we have cash account receivable inventory and property and acumen, let's copy all these items and paste it over in receivable inventory and property and acumen, let's copy all these items and paste it over here as paste as values. And, uh, and similarly, we'll copy 
the values as well. Select the entire range and paste it over here as values. And since the unit is the same, which is USD thousand, so I'll copy and paste it over here. Uh, the first three item is related to uh, the current asset. So let's bifurcate it and calculate current assets separately by using the submission formula and press Control R to copy the same towards right. And have top border by pressing Alt H uh, BP. Similarly, the plant and uh, the property and equipment is basically your fixed assets. So let's write fixed assets and uh, take the property uh, and uh, property and equipment as is for your fixed assets. Press Control R to copy the same towards right. Control B and Alt H B P for top border. Now moving on to the liabilities and the equity section, we have accounts payable, debt, equity, and retained ending. So let's copy the entire uh, range of cells, move uh, to my financial model, and paste it as values. Here, accounts payable and debt is basically your liability. So let's write total liabilities and Let's first copy the values before we do some sort of formatting. So let's control C and paste as values by pressing Alt H B S over here. And again, using the same unit, uh, control C and control B. In setting rows and uh, we will calculate total liabilities. So for total liabilities, what we need to do, we just need to insert the submission formula and then press Control R to copy the same towards right and do the formatting by press Control B to bold and Alt H B P for top border and uh, for for total equity equities, uh, we again uh, use the submission formula and press Control R to copy the formula towards right. Control B and Alt H B P for top order. So one last thing that we need to do is just to calculate total assets. Total assets over here. Control B and Alt H B D for double border. USD thousand, and we will add current assets and current liabilities. To calculate total assets and similarly we will calculate total liabilities and equities by adding total liabilities and total equities and press control r and doing the same formatting as we did for total assets by, control, by pressing control b for bold and alt h b d for uh, both borders now we will have check uh, right at the bottom to see whether my balance sheet is balanced or not. Since these are all the items which is given, values which is given to us, but this check will help us identifying whether my balance sheet is balanced or not for the forecasted period, preferably. So here we have uh, uh, exported the income statement and the balance sheet, uh, the data that we are given with. So let's. Uh, start doing the forecasting. Uh, first thing first is, as we are aware that we discussed recently uh, during our uh, presentation, that the first step that is historical numbers and the next step is the assumption. And then you can move on to the uh, income statement. So let's, uh, so we have inserted the historical numbers. So let's move on to the assumption section. So for the assumption, the first start with the revenue. We have uh, the revenue for the year uh, 2018 uh, till 2022. So let's calculate the revenue growth for the uh, last five years in yearly basis. <clears throat> so what we have seen that the revenue growth of the company is going down uh, over the last four years and but an, with an average of 10%. So, so for now, let's forecast uh, a 10% growth rate for your uh, 
for your revenue and we assume that the same will be kept uh, for the next five years. Again, uh, as part of uh, the industry practice, uh, we are, this, is, this is not the approach which is recommended and being used. Uh, but uh, later we'll see when we do the tech side operating model that how do we forecast the revenues and the expenses of a real life uh, of a real life company but for the purpose of uh, forecasting and doing the basic financial model let's do uh, let's keep it very simple and, uh, and, and 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 take an assumption of 10% growth rate for your uh, revenue so let's take the 10% growth rate uh, to forecast your uh, uh, top line in your revenue uh, the next item we have is uh, uh, the gross profit. So let's calculate gross profit for the last five years. Uh, so in, in 2018, we have the gross profit of 61%, uh, uh, which basically increased to 62.4% uh, by the year 2022. So let's keep uh, the, the, the discount rate at the same level, which is somewhere around 62%. Right, and uh, for the next five years, again, this is not the ideal way to calculate the gross profit uh, for any uh, for any company when you do the valuation or you are the when you build the financial model. But again, as I said earlier, that just to keep things simple, for the part one of my uh, workshop session, uh, we are just taking the historical assumption as my uh, forecasted assumptions, uh, and later we'll see how we can forecast the revenue and. Uh, the expenses uh, for any real life company. So let's use this uh, gross profit assumption to calculate the cost of goods sold. And make sure that you have a negative sign uh, before uh, COPS and press Control R uh, to copy the same formula to goods right. Uh, similarly, using uh, uh, the same thought for uh, the salaries and benefits. Let's uh, have salaries and benefits as percentage of revenue. So let's take uh, salaries in the numerator and divide it by sales. Press Alt H P for the, to have a percentage sign and then press Control R to copy the same formula towards right. Now you can see that salaries and benefits uh, is basically somewhere around 19% on an average basis uh, with regards to sales. So let's keep this thing as constant as, as, as 19% uh, for, the, for the next five years. And using the same assumption, we can calculate the salaries and benefits for the next five years. Uh, for rent and overhead, uh, again, uh, if you see the, these are the constant number, it is not increasing uh, with in relation to sales. Uh, so therefore, let's keep this number as uh, a constant number and it could be somewhere around uh, on an average, uh, it could be somewhere around 11,000. So let's keep it as uh, a constant rather than taking any percentage of sale or something of that sort by pressing control R. So now we have forecasted EBITDA uh, as, we, as, as we are aware of the fact that as part of our financial modeling steps, uh, we have done with uh, step three, which is forecasted to, to just, just to forecast revenue down to EBITDA. Now we can move on to forecast working capital, capital assets and capital structure. And for that, we need to build a separate uh, schedules for each and every month. So let's go down uh, to uh, go down to the very end. And let's have a separate header. And we will copy it and paste it. We have the same formatting. And let's write working capital schedules. So for working capital schedule, the first thing we have is account receivable. So let's see how we can forecast account receivable. The second we have is uh, account payable. And the third we have is inventory. Again, the unit would be the same, which is USD 1000. 
And for account receivable, uh, we can take these numbers from my balance sheet. Accounts payable again from the balance sheet and inventory uh, from uh, the asset side, current asset side. And we can have the same formula copied for the next five years. Uh, so for account receivables, what we are interested in is basically account receivable days. Uh, so let's write accounts receivable days. For account receivable days, what we need to do, we need to insert the formula which we uh, discussed earlier in our presentation. Uh, so how we can calculate account receivable days, we'll take um, a 365 numerator, uh, right? And in the, in the denominator, we open bracket, take the revenue, and divide it with the receivables. So here we can see the account receivable days are somewhere around 18 for the last uh, five years. Similarly, for account payable days, accounts payable days. For accounts payable days, uh, we can uh, calculate account payable days by taking 365 in numerator. And in the denominator, we will take uh, uh, cost of goods sold and divide it by accounts payable and bracket close. And make sure you have a negative sign because your cost is a negative number. And we will see that the account payable days uh, is somewhere around 36 days. Uh, repeating the same process for inventory. And uh, let's calculate inventory days. And to calculate inventory days, we uh, use uh, the same formula we, we, we use for the accounts payable. Like we'll take uh, 365 in numerator and in the denominator, we will take cost of goods sold and divided it by inventory and close bracket. Make sure you have a negative sign because your call is a negative number. And press Control R to copy the same towards right. Now you can see that your account receivable days are somewhere around 18. So you can have, you, you can forecast uh, it accordingly. Similarly, for uh, accounts payable days, the average is 36. So let's keep 36 for accounts payable days. And for our inventory days, is 73. So let's keep the same for inventory. And now we can forecast uh, the account receivable days by uh, taking the revenue divided it by uh, days and divided by 365. So let's take the, uh, so for the, uh, uh, in order to calculate the forecasted number of, uh, so let's reference it to the formula. So here's the formula for our quick reference. So let's have a quick look uh, how we can calculate or forecast the account receivable uh, using the account receivable base. So according to this formula, what we need to do, we need to take uh, uh, receivable days, multiply it with sales for the year 2023 and divide it by 365. And we can copy the same formula towards right. Uh, using uh, the accounts payable formula to calculate accounts payable, uh, we will take payable days in the numerator, multiply it with cost of goods sold and divided by 365. And then copy the same towards right to calculate accounts for the next of the five years. And for, uh, for inventory, I will take the inventory days, multiply it with cost of goods sold and divided by 365. So here we calculate the inventory. Now we can calculate the working capital of the company so that we can calculate the changes in working capital, changes in working capital and which is needed for our cash flow statement, changes in working capital. So 
let's have the same unit, which is 1000 USD 1000. And working capital is basically your uh, account receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. So here's your working capital uh, for each of the 10 years and the changes in working capital. Since we are interested in the change in working capital for the year 2023 and onwards, so let's calculate the change in working capital for the year 2023 uh, by subtracting uh, the 2022 working capital from 2023 working capital to calculate the changes in working capital. The next schedule that we are going to build is for fixed assets. So let's build the fixed asset schedule. And uh, fixed asset schedule will start with the opening balance. So opening balance, we will add if there is any capex and we will subtract if there is any depreciation of course and such that we will arrive at the ending balance of fixed assets. So since we are interested in the year 2023 and onwards, so let's start with the opening balance of 2023. And we are, since we are all aware of the fact that the opening balance for 2023 would be uh, nothing but the ending balance of 2022, which we can take it from the balance sheet. And uh, so let's connect the opening balance with the previous year ending balance and do some sort of formatting. Control D and Alt H D P for top border. And uh, have the submission formula for ending balance. So how do we calculate the capex and depreciation? And if you go to the data sheet, you will see in the cash flow statement that the company is uh, incurring investment in property and uh, equipment uh, of 15 uh, million dollar each year. So let's have the same assumption for the next five years as well. So let's insert 15 uh, million dollar for each of the next uh, five years and the unit would be same as USD 1000. And for depreciation, again, let's calculate the, uh, the depreciation percentage over here. So let's calculate depreciation percentage of opening balance. So for percentage of opening balance, what we will do, we will basically take the depreciation and the numerator from the income statement, which is 18 million and divided it by the last year closing balance of fixed assets. And we will see the percentage is somewhere around 40. Let's have a negative sign uh, because your depreciation is an expense, which is a negative number. And you can see the, the percentage is somewhere around 41% on an average, uh, which is basically the percentage to be applied on the opening balance uh, of fixed assets. So let's have same assumption, which is 41% uh, for the next of the five years. And Let's link it uh, accordingly. So we'll have negative sign, multiply 41% with the ending balance of previous year, or you may call it opening balance of the next year and copy the same formula by pressing control R, such that you have forecasted the ending balance of fixed assets. Uh, moving on to the next schedule, uh, the next schedule is basically the debt schedule. Uh, so the debt schedule, uh, again, the debt schedule start with opening balance. You will add if there is any drawdown, any disbursement or any new debt issued. You will subtract if there is any repayments. And you such that you will have an ending balance. Ending balance. Let's do the, so let's have the same uh, unit, which is USD 1000. And 
do the formatting by pressing Control B and Alt S D B for top order. Let's have the formatting by pressing Control B and Alt S B B for top order. So the opening balance again uh, for the debt for the year 2023 would be the ending balance of 2022. So let's take it uh, from the balance sheet and link it accordingly. Uh, and do the and insert the submission formula to pop, to basically calculate the ending balance for the year 2023. So we are not given with any assumption that company will, will the company take any new debt or not. And similarly, we are not giving with any assumption whether the company is repaying their debt or not. So for the sake of simplicity, we are taking both the things zero. Uh, but in the actual uh, scenario, you need to consult to the financial notes and see uh, what kind of the loan company has taken and how would you forecast it using uh, the repayment schedule as per uh, their agreement with the banks. The last, we will calculate the interest expense of uh, the company. And uh, for the interest expense, uh, let's take this number from uh, the income statement for the previous years. So we have the interest expense for the year 2018 to 2022. Which is as which is like these, and let's calculate uh, the interest cost uh, for for the last five years. So we can calculate the interest cost by taking the interest expense in the numerator and the debt amount in the denominator, and we will see the interest cost is somewhere around five percent, and uh, which generally remains the same for the last five years. So as part of our uh, assumption, we can take this as we can take this number for the next five years for the sake of simplicity and apply the same uh, to uh, to calculate the interest expense uh, for the next five years. So now we are done with the supporting schedules. Let's uh, populate the income statement and the balance sheet to complete. Uh, my financial statements, and then we will move on to forecast the cash flow statement. So the, the depreciation we have already uh, forecasted, and we can link it with the, the depreciation number uh, we forecast in the fixed asset schedule. Make sure you have it as a negative number because this is which, which is going to be subtracted. Similarly, for interest expense, uh, you can take it from your interest, interest debt interest schedule. Uh, you calculated it just now and by pressing control R to have the same thing for the next the five years and for taxes we can take effective tax rate which is basically let's calculate the effective tax rate right now over here so effective tax effective tax rate which is basically tax divided by your EBT. So here's your effective tax rate. And uh, the effective tax rate for the company is somewhere around 29%. Uh, so let's take this assumption for your next five year period. And then you can link it with your uh, model accordingly by multiplying EBT with your effective tax rate of 29%. After completing completing the income statement, uh, we move on to the balance sheet. And uh, for the balance sheet, we will not start with cash. We first start with uh, the account receivable, which we have forecasted in our working capital schedule. We take it as it is. And for the inventory, again, uh, we forecast it in the working capital schedule. We take it uh, from here. Uh, for property, plant, and equipment, we will go back. We'll go to our fixed asset schedule, fixed asset schedule, and take it and take the ending balance uh, for accounts payable. Uh, we go to the working capital schedule and take the accounts payable number that we have forecasted and control R for debt. We go to debt interest schedule, go down and take the ending balance, which is again this would remain the same as $30 million the next of the five years. And for equity, we assume the company is not injecting any fresh equity, so we'll keep it as it is, $70 million. 
and for retain ending, what we'll do, we'll take uh, the retain ending of previous year and add the income statement, uh, add the net income from the income statement. Since there is no dividend uh, forecast, or we are not forecasting any dividend, so we assume that uh, all the entire income is being retained uh, by the company as part of retain ending into the equity section of the company. So uh, the only thing that you are left with is basically your uh, cash. So let's build the cash flow statement for uh, for to, in order to forecast the cash. And in, and after forecasting the the cash, we would be uh, we would be able to complete our uh, three statement financial model. So so let's write cash flow statement cash. Flow statement and the cash flow statement is you are aware of the fact that it's divided into three segments. The first is cash flow from operation, which starts with the net income, and you add non cash items like depreciation, and you subtract changes in working net working capital such that you will calculate cash flows. From operations. Uh, these items will have the same units, which is thousand dollars. So I'll have the same uh, unit as dollar and thousand. And let's do some sort of formatting by pressing Control B and Alt H B P for top border. Control B and Alt H B P for top border. And let's start with 2023 because we are interested in forecasted period. Uh, we will take the net income from the income statement. Uh, and the depreciation again from the income statement as part of non cash item. And uh, the change in working capital, we have recently calculated it by working capital schedule. We we'll take it as it is, such that we have uh, the cash flow from operations. Uh, for the year 2023 and we'll copy the same formula to calculate, calculate it for the next three years. Moving on to the other item, which is CAPEX. And uh, after subtracting CAPEX, we will calculate cash flow from cash flows from investing or cash flow from investments. Same unit, which is uh, USD 1000. And for CAPEX, we go to the uh, fixed asset schedule and take the number of $15 million. Make sure you have a negative sign to it because these are again the cash outflow. And since all the expenses and cash outflows should be in a negative sign, so we are following the same practice. After calculating cash flows from investments, Let's move on to the cash flow from financing. Uh, it will start with debt issued, debt issued, and debt repaid, right, and dividends. And after taking impact of all three items, we will calculate cash flows from financing. Since it will have the same unit, which is USD 1000, so I'll copy and paste it as it is. Do some, some, do some sort of formatting by Control B and Alt as BP for top order. So, since the debt issued and debt repaid is again something which is zero in our model, so let's uh, take it as it is and press Control D and Control R. Dividend again is zero. We are not assuming any dividend, so keep it. As zero, so cash flow from financing is something which gives you uh, a nil impact. So it does not have any impact on cash flow from financing. So after calculating all three uh, cash flows, we can calculate net cash generated. Net cash generated. Uh, so net cash generated is basically is nothing but the sum of all three. Uh, cash flows. So we will do the formatting. Control B and Alt H B D for both the borders. 
and we will sum cash flow from uh, operations, cash flow from investments, and cash flow from financing. Press Control R to copy uh, the same formula for the months of two, three years. Let's add. Let's add the beginning balance. Let's add the beginning balance. So the beginning balance is basically uh, your. Uh, so for the year 2023, the beginning balance would be the ending balance of 2022. So let's link it accordingly. And such that it gives you the ending balance. So I'll sum it up. Net cash generated and beginning balance. And similarly for the next year, the beginning balance would be the ending balance of previous year. We'll sum it up to get the ending balance and so on and so forth. So here is the ending cash balance. So let's go up to my uh, to my balance sheet and link this ending cash balance with my uh, cash flow statement and fill it towards right such that my balance sheet is balanced. Uh, so now we have uh, completed the three statement financial model uh, and the second part of uh, this uh, basic uh, financial modeling discussion is the DCA valuation. So before we move on uh, to the DCA valuation and part two of our uh, session, let's take a quick break. And that break could be uh, your Namaz break as well. And we will resume the session uh, at 5.15. And we'll start by taking uh, a question from your side first, and then we'll uh, continue where we left. So let's take a break, Javeria, and we will resume the session at 5.15. All right. All right. So it's already 5.15, so let's get started. Uh, so I'll start with taking a few questions from your side. If anyone has any, please uh, unmute yourself and ask uh, so that we can move on to the remaining part of our uh, discussion. So please, the floor is open. You can ask questions, whatever we discussed so far. So do we have any questions? Hi there. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, Walim, uh, basically, uh, my question is okay, how to go about the assumptions you have taken. Like, uh, if we are working on a textile industry, so mm -hmm. the growth and uh, revenue, if we talk about growth and inter uh, segment wise, how can we approximate the growth in the assumptions? Mein? Correct. Uh, so for so let's park this question for our uh, discussion in part two. Uh, we will dedicatedly talk about the textile company operating in Pakistan and how we can come up with our own assumptions. As you rightly mentioned, what what could be the growth assumptions in terms of revenue, and what could be the uh, margin assumptions as far as the profitability is concerned. So we'll take this up and maybe discuss in the part two of our discussion. Um, if you have a question specifically for the financial modeling and uh, how do we calculate, uh, you know, how, how do we forecast the three state financial model, do let, do let me know. Thanks for the question. So if we do not have any question, let's resume the session where we left. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. 
Um, sir, I have a question. Like, if we have other heads in um account uh, payables, uh, like the payables of the company, if they are other than account payables, like note payables or some other payables, so uh, are we supposed to club them with the account payables and then calculate them um the assumptions and go forward? Like, I'm confused with that. So, first of all, you have to see what is the quantum of that number is. If it is significant as part of your balance sheet, compare it to the overall size of the balance sheet. If the other payables ka number is bigger, then you can you need to deep dive into it and see where, where these numbers are coming from. So, then you will have to focus on the number of If the number of other payables is not that much big, you can keep it constant so that it, it will not impact your cash flows. But other payables is different from the accounts payables. So accounts payables are those uh, numbers which is there uh, as part of your cost of goods sold or the payables to the creditors. Uh, but other payables may include some other items as well. But you need really need to see uh, what's the quantum of uh, this number is. If it is not material, considering the overall size of the balance sheet, you can uh, keep it as it is or keep constant so that it will not impact your cash flows because it may not be a material impact of a material impact to your, uh, to, to your valuation at the end of the day. So similar would be the case for uh, other hedge if we have in the uh, assets and in the equities portion. Correct. Uh, so generally, again, as we discussed uh, during our slide, is to, is to remember the 80-20 uh, we will only focus on the 20% of the items in the balance sheet and the income statement, which drives the 80% of the valuation. So there are many items on the balance sheet which you do not need to spend your time on to and keep those items as constant uh, because uh, one is they are quite immaterial and the other, it, it, you, you will not have enough information as uh, as part of your secondary information to, to understand uh, the item itself bit more in detail so let's so let's keep those numbers as constant as possible as far as my understanding is concerned but you can discuss uh, other than thanks Javeria. so do we have any other questions okay let's start it so uh so here, here, here we left before the break. We have uh, forecasted the three stable financial model, and uh, in, during the break, what we have done, uh, what I have done, is just to do the DCA valuation uh, in the interest of time, rather than doing it during the session because uh, we are not left with much of the time to focus more on the textile part of our discussion. Uh, so here's the free cash flows to the firm. So if you remember the formula, it's basically net operating profit after tax plus depreciation minus changes in working capital minus capex. So again, uh, we use the same formula, take the numbers from the financial statement we have forecasted and come up with FCFF. And what we are, uh, what we need to do now is just to calculate the terminal values using the assumptions that we are given with and, 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 and calculate the net present value to calculate the enterprise value of the company. And at the uh, at the end, we will determine the intrinsic value per share of the company itself. Uh, so let's try to complete this thing the next uh, next ten minutes, and then we move on to the uh, discussion uh, of the part two of our uh, of our workshop. So uh, now uh, we have so so uh, for the terminal value, what we need, if you remember the formula of the terminal value or the bottom growth. A method we need two assumptions we need perpetual growth rate and the VAC. so for the perpetual growth rate we are given with a growth rate of five percent again in your case uh, when you build the financial model of your company you need to understand that what kind of company what kind of industry that company is operating and how you can uh, come up with the, the perpetual growth rate like the company uh, uh, operating in the cement sector may not have the five percent growth rate because it's quite stable. You cannot you cannot expect uh, the cement sector to grow that big. But for the companies like operating in uh, the technology uh, sector, you can expect a far bigger number of perpetual growth rate. Uh, similarly, for textile sector, you need to see in which textile segment the company is operating, how uh, uh, 
the the world global economy is expected to grow in the next five years, and then you can come up with your uh, own assumption because the textile revenue are much uh, are, are highly dependent upon uh, uh, the, the the export uh, revenues, which is of course dependent upon the global demand in the global GDP growth rate. Uh, so in our case, uh, which is of course a manufacturing company in the name of private company INC. Uh, the perpetual growth rate given to us is 5%. And uh, we can calculate the VAC uh, by using, you know, rate of equity, cost of equity, uh, rate of debt, cost of debt, and tax rate. And for that, we need to calculate the cost of equity. Again, for the cost of equity, we are given with uh, the risk period of 10%. Again, this is 10-year government bond. And if we talk about, uh, from the perspective of Pakistani market, uh, the 10-year the, the, the government PIB, uh, rate is somewhere around 15 percent you should take it 15 beta is something that you can calculate it of your own stock by taking 10 year last 10 year prices uh, correlated with the index prices and then calculate uh, the beta on your own rather than take it from any portal and the market risk premium generally in pakistan is six percent but in our case it's five so let's using these assumptions by taking the risk free rate uh, plus beta into market risk premium there you can calculate the uh, cost of equity. Uh, we can take this cost of equity uh, for our VAC calculation. And uh, so for cost of debt, if you remember, the 5% is the cost of debt. Tax rate, we took uh, 29%. And uh, rate of equity, uh, you can calculate it using the book value. Ideally, you should calculate using the uh, the market value, but uh, for now, for the sake of simplicity, let's take it the book value, which is again the total equity as of 2022 divided by uh, the total size of uh, the balance sheet. Uh, so it's 82 percent, and uh, the rate of debt is one minus uh, the rate of equity. And now you can calculate. Uh, the VAC, which is rate of equity into weight of into cost of equity plus weight of debt into cost of debt into one minus uh, tax rate. So the VAC is fifteen percent. Uh, so let's calculate the terminal value using this VAC and perpetual growth rate by taking point twenty seven cash flows multiplied with one plus. G, which is 5%, divided by VAC minus G. So here is the terminal value, and now we can calculate the uh, present value of uh, the company. So let's write this. Uh, so let's write the valuation. Uh, so by taking the net present value of the future cash flows, which is free cash flows to the firm, we will uh, come up with the enterprise value and the enterprise value we can calculate using the NPV formula. Rate is again the VAC and the cash flow is basically for the year 2023 till 2027. Since this is an enterprise value, we need to subtract debt and add cash to calculate the equity value. So debt, we can take it from uh, the balance sheet, which is 30, uh, $30 million, which should be a negative sign because it is subtracted. And add cash, we can take it from the uh, balance sheet, 2022 value. And we need to add it, so keep it positive. And then submit uh, some uh, the uh, all three values to calculate the equity value. You can uh, divide this equity value by number of shares outstanding, which is uh, twenty million in our case, and the intrinsic value would be somewhere around thirty-seven. So here you can calculate the intrinsic value using the uh, DCF methodology, GCF valuation methodology. So this is it from uh, this is it as far as the part one is concerned. So let's move on to the part two of our uh, 
So let's move on to the uh, part two of our session, which is uh, regarding the operating model of a textile company. So let's get started. The first thing, so whenever you do the uh, evaluation of building the financial model of uh, any company, uh, you need to understand the overall value chain of the sector itself. So as far as the textile is concerned, we know that it starts with the cotton fiber. And then when cotton fiber is converted into yarn, then yarn is processed to make the fabric moving on to the tying and printing. And finally, the stitching part of it, then, you, then it will reach to the end consumer. Since we are focusing more on uh, uh, the first three uh, uh, part of our uh, uh, of, of the value chain, which is basically uh, processing cotton to make yarn and yarn into uh, fabric, so let's uh, deep uh, deep dive into the entire process. So, as part of uh, uh, the, as part of the value chain, the first process is basically known as ginning, where the cotton fiber is con uh, converted into cotton beads. And, uh, and, and the ginning machine is being uh, used to basically convert the cotton fiber into cotton beads. The next step is again the spinning, where the, the, the cotton beads uh, are uh, being processed to make yarn. And in Pakistan, generally what happens is that uh, cotton beads are procured both locally and imported because we do not produce enough cotton beads available locally. So the spinning mills have to rely on imported cotton bales as well to fulfill their uh, needs. And the third process that we are interested in is weaving where the yarn is basically converted into the fabric and uh, the looms are the machinery which uh, are being installed in the weaving unit to convert yarn into fabric. So again, uh, we'll do a, a very min, a very mini case study for a textile company, and the textile uh, company name is Fast Textile Mills Limited, and this company uh, basically manufactures yarn and hosiery. And as we discussed earlier uh, in the previous slide, that if uh, if if company manufactures yarn, it would require cotton bales, right? So it would require cotton bales to process. Uh, uh, to, to process and make the fine finished goods in form of yarn. Uh, in our case, uh, which is fast textile mills limited, uh, it procures cotton uh, from the local market and in the, from the international market uh, as well. And 50% of their need is uh, basically fulfilled locally and remaining 50% uh, met from the international market. And then it makes yarn which, it's, which it sells in the market and 50% of it consumed uh, in-house, basically uh, to make hosiery uh, products and 50% uh, and sells into the market. So there are two questions that comes to the, come, uh, that comes up into the mind of any analyst upfront while initially understanding the overall business model of this fast textile is limited that uh, what kind of impact it will have when uh, company procures a, a cotton bales from international market uh, uh, if we compare it with the local market. So any one of you can uh, uh, say anything about that what could be the reason and what could be the deciding factor for the company uh, to decide whether it should procure cotton bales locally or from the international market. Considering the fact that the company is uh, operating uh, to manufacture yarn first uh, so, what could be the deciding factor for the company to procure international from the international market or from the local market? So, anyone can uh, guess what could be the factor. And this is basically the general uh, rule of thumb in the uh, in the local market. Uh, yes, Munir. Yes, Munir, go ahead, please. Uh, I think they're writing questions in the chat box. Okay, so someone says dollar quality exchange rate quality. Yes. So as you as so as it is rightly mentioned, the major factor is basically the quality. So uh, the better the quality, the the better the yield you will have, and you can produce better quality yarn at the end of the day. Uh, so if 
the international market is on a higher side and the the price of the cotton beans in the international market is higher than the local market uh, the deciding factor could be again the exchange rate uh, and uh, and and also the quality of the yarn uh, of, of the cotton bale itself because better quality the cotton bales give you a more heat uh, from which you can more yarns out of it similarly the next question comes to your mind is uh, why the company is selling yarn into the market directly and not consuming the entire yarn uh, locally uh, i mean in house to produce hosiery what could be the factor which makes the company to decide to sell yarn in the market and then procure uh, yarn for hosiery segment what do you think So someone says transfer pricing. Anyone else? Demand. Correct. Exactly. So so it's basically uh, the demand supply factor of it. So so what happens is that generally uh, the textile uh, companies keep the two segments very separate, and they see the, each segment as a separate company. So if yarn, uh, if you have yarn and the market is going good, and if you got, uh, if you, if you get the better price from the market as uh, when you selling your yarn uh, outside your company, then you prefer to sell it into the market and make money out of it uh, rather than keeping it in house, which you can use it later. And 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 then similarly, when they want to procure it uh, or hosiery manufacturing, they'll see what kind of market it is right now, whether they I should procure it in house, or they should purchase it from the international market. So again, as it is rightly mentioned by uh, many of you, that it's basically the mechanism of supply and demand, and the better pricing and the better quality yarn that is available in the market, which will give you eventually the better yield. So this is basically uh, the few assumptions uh, that we have come up with uh, for our uh, company, which is Fast Textile Mills Limited. We'll see how we can uh, build the financial model or you may see uh, an operating model for this company, taking all the assumptions into account. The next uh, set of assumptions that we are given with is the energy requirement. Since we know that the second highest uh, cost that the company, that, that the textile company has after the raw material is basically the energy, the energy, the fuel, the fuel and power cost. So in my case, which is the fast exercise Miss limited, it is given that the company has a sanctioned load of uh, uh, 50 megawatt and, and the running load of 35 megawatts, not 50, it's written 50 in, in the slide, but it's basically a typo, it's a 35 megawatt running load. So it's a general rule of thumb that company do have a sanctioned load, which is on the higher side, but the running load of the company is of course below than the sanctioned load. Uh, which could be you know 10% uh, below or 20% below the sanction group. Uh, whenever you work on uh, the cost part of a textile mill, you need and you work to forecast the energy require, requirement of the company, you need to understand what is the running load of the company itself and how the running load would increase in the near future. And using that uh, running load assumption, you can uh, forecast the, uh, the energy cost of the of the company and in in our case which is fast excel is limited it is given that uh, out of the out of the running load of 35 megawatt the company is using uh, solar so a few of its requirement would be fulfilled by the solar plant it has already installed and the remaining is being met from the gas generators and from the electricity grid uh, it has uh, uh, for its uh, factory so let's take all these assumptions into account and build our own uh, operating model uh, for the company. So let me open an Excel file. So here's, uh, so here's the operating model which I have already built uh, for this uh, fast exile Mills limited company which we are working on with a set of assumptions which is given to us so let's let's go through it quickly and then we'll take your questions uh, specific to this 
case study or maybe in general for the textile sector in Pakistan. Uh, since we are building an operating model, so uh, we start with the sales uh, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, cost of goods sold and other uh, operating expenses to calculate the operating income. Since we are interested in calculating the operating income um, only. So uh, for as far as the sales is concerned, uh, you can see uh, down that uh, the revenue breakup that we are given with is basically export sales and the local sales. So the company is basically selling 90% of its uh, revenue uh, outside of the country in form of exports and the remaining is uh, local sales. And uh, since we know that the revenue is comprised of sales from the two segments, which is hosiery and uh, spinning segment. So let's focus on the spinning uh, hosiery segment first. What we are given with that the hosiery segment has the sale of around uh, 30 million uh, rupees uh, for the year 2019 and it increased to 77 million rupees for the, uh, up to 2023. And it has it, has, it also has some intersegmental sale as well, which is quite uh, minimum, which is somewhere around less than 1% of the total uh, sale of the segment itself. But in order to forecast uh, the revenue for this hosiery segment, what we need to do first, we need to understand what's the total installed capacity uh, of this segment, which is there at, uh, which, which shall be available in the financial statements of the company itself. And we have this assumption written right in front of the screen, which is 55 uh, million dozens uh, per year. So uh, the first fast textile can manufacture Hosiery uh, up to 55 million dozen, 55 million dozen Hosiery units per year. And uh, over, the, over the last five years, we can see that the capacity utilization of the company is somewhere around 80% on an average, and it has been increasing over the years. Uh, so this, so this is, so this is the way you can uh, use uh, the information given in the financial statement and forecast it. Uh, using the uh, capacity utilization factor. So uh, you can make an assumption that in my case, what I assume that uh, the capacity utilization would be somewhere around 85%. And using this capacity utilization factor, I can calculate the production of the company, keeping the installed capacity at the same level, such that I have come up with the production for the next five years. Uh, after forecasting the production, uh, we need to forecast the prices. Uh, so for the prices, we, we, we can calculate the historical prices in rupee terms and the dollar terms both. So for the uh, rupee term, what we need to do, we need to divide the revenue with the production units for each year so that you can see how per dozen uh, uh, of price of the company is moving for the last five years. And then you can calculate uh, the rupee per dozen price into dollar per dozen price as well uh, using the exchange rate. So I have the exchange rate, uh, average assumption, average exchange rate yearly uh, for the last five years. And I divide this rupee uh, uh, price per dozen by the historical exchange rate to calculate the uh, dollar uh, price per dozen uh, for this company to see what are the dollar prices because uh, since we are selling this uh, product into the international market, we are more interested in dollar per dozen price to see uh, what has been the price uh, of uh, my product over the years and how we can forecast it accordingly. So you can see the price is somewhere around 6.6 dollar uh, per dozen on an average. So I forecast it uh, uh, using the growth rate of 2% and the growth rate of 2% is basically based on the fact that generally uh, the GDP growth rate uh, at a global level, the target GDP growth rate of, at a global level is somewhere around 2%. So I kept it too. But uh, you should come up with your own assumption backed by your own logic and rationale. And after discussing with your own mentor and the faculty advisor, you can make your own assumption that what would be uh, the growth rate, price growth rate uh, in your case. Uh, for uh, dollar per dozen price uh, uh, of your company product as far as the hosiery segment is concerned. Similarly, if you forecast uh, the 
a dollar per dozen uh, price for your uh, uh, company, you need to forecast the exchange rate as well in order to convert the dollar pricing into the rupee pricing. And uh, again, you need to forecast the exchange rate as well. So what I have done, I basically took the base exchange rate as 248, which is basically an average exchange rate for the year 2023. And I and, and, and I forecast that my exchange rate would be somewhere around 300 on an average basis for the year 2024. So I increased it, uh, DVAL. Uh, I basically took the exchange rate DVAL at 20% for the year 2024 and kept it 8% flat for the next four years, which is basically an average DVAL assumption uh, generally taken industry-wide uh, uh, by, the, by different analysts. So in this way, you can forecast the positive uh, segment revenue uh, for, for my company. So before I move on to the next segment, which is spinning segment, and see what kind of assumption we can have for the, the revenue forecast of this spinning segment, I, I would like to see if there is any question from your side uh, so that we can discuss right away because the, we are running short of time right now. So please feel free to ask right now. You can unmute yourself and ask. If you have any questions with regards to textile uh, and with regards to uh, revenue forecasting and its assumptions. There are no questions. Or maybe they are tired a bit. <laughs> okay. Okay, fair enough. So we are left with only 15 minutes. So I'll try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. But it's better if we have more questions so that we can better understand uh, the concept specifically related to textile sector uh, as it is the uh, subject matter for your uh, competition. Mozambil, uh, please unmute your, yourself and ask. I can see your hand. How to go about the capacity utilization if this is an expansion? Yes, sir. Am I audible to you, sir? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh. Achha, sir, I have to ask you this question that if we have our sales in dollars, then if we have seen some unusual pattern, देखें या फिर कोई ऐसा पैटर्न बनता हुआ देखे ही ना हमें मतलब सेल्स ऊपर हो रही है फिर नीचे हो रही है फिर ऊपर हो रही है तो तो उस उसके बाद हम किन एजम्पशंस के ऊपर फोकस करेंगे तो एक तो हमने सेल्स को देख देख लिया कि अगर इसमें कोई हमें विजिबल पैटर्न जो है कोई रैशनल पैटर्न हमें नजर नहीं आ रहा तो इन दैट केस हमारे पास कौन सी अल्टरनेट चीजें हो सकती हैं जहां जहां से हम फिर उसको थोड़ा उसके रैशनल बिल्डिंग में भी इस तरह आगे बढ़ेंगे अगर रेवेन्यू ना हो तो हम दूसरी एजम्पशंस कौन सी ले सकते हैं Hmm. Again, uh, for the revenue, of course, we have two factors. One is uh, volume and the other one is price. Your question is related to price. So the price, to, uh, as, as you said, price ka agar pattern hume nazar nahi aa raha hai, or there is unevenness in terms of price per dozen, for example, in our case. And you cannot, uh, we cannot conclude the fact that what could be the future price per dozen in your case while looking at the historical price per dozen. Uh, so what you can do, you can see that there should be some pattern for, for, for certain years of, uh, for certain years as well. For example, you can see the historical trend in 5 years, you can see You will have a fair idea that in the past 10 years, the price is going to be a dollar per dozen, for example. And in that, you will see something like this, where you will see something like this, that per unit, this price per unit is a dollar price. Hai. So that can give you a fair idea that I can kind of focus on it. Again, and the previous years, like if you are focusing on 2024, the 2023 or 2022 ke years, honge, that is more relevant in your case because these are the years which, which, which are more relevant on which you can build on your assumptions uh, more, uh, uh, more, more logically. So the previous two years, three years ki assumption hongi, aap unko bhi leke dekh sakte hain. Ab zada piche agar aap unevenness dekh rahi hai, so you can ignore those unevenness. But again, given the information set of uh, set of information you have as per the publicly available annual report, this is this is best you can do as far as your assumption is concerned. Or iske liye aapko information zada 
नहीं अवेलेबल होती इन ऑर्डर टू डिटरमाइन दी प्राइस पर डजन मतलब प्राइस पर यूनिट फॉर योर कंपनी सो दिस इज माई टेक एज फार एज योर क्वेश्चन इज कंसर्न बट अगेन फ्यूचर जो फोकास होगी उसकी प्राइस ग्रोथ क्या लेनी है अगेन इट इज योर व्यू अगेन यू कैन कीप द सेम कॉन्स्टेंट नंबर यू विल हैव जीरो प्राइस ग्रोथ यू कैन हैव वेरी मिनिमम प्राइस ग्रोथ ऑफ पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट सिंस यू आर सेलिंग इन टू द इंटरनेशनल मार्केट सो इंटरनेशनल मार्केट में ग्लोबल ग्रोथ रेट भी बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट हो जाता है कि प्राइस की जो ग्रोथ है पर यूनिट वो आपकी ग्लोबल ग्रोथ रेट पे डिपेंडेंट होती है टू एन एक्सटेंट लाइक हमने देखा कि पिछला साल थोड़ा सा हमारा सबसाइड रहा है ग्लूमी रहा है तो उसमें आपको एक डाउन साइड दिखेगी या प्राइस या तो सेम नहीं है या प्राइस थोड़ी सी डिप लिया है सर जैसे अगर आप देखें यहाँ पे तो या प्राइस वैसे बढ़ रही थी सिक्स पॉइंट थ्री सिक्स पॉइंट सिक्स सिक्स पॉइंट नाइन एंड देन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री में प्राइस मोर लेस सेम रही है थोड़ी कुछ केसेस में गिरी भी है कुछ और कंपनीज की अगर आप देखेंगे और एक और लास्ट थिंग आपके इस क्वेश्चन में वो ये हो सकता है उसका जवाब की यू कैन ऑल्सो लुक एट द पियर कंपनी एज वेल You will find other companies like if you are working on only one textile company, आप दूसरी टेक्सटाइल कंपनी की भी फोकास कर लें उसके रेवेन्यूज देखें उसकी प्राइस पर यूनिट देखें किस तरह से फ्लो कर रही है तो अगर कोई सिमिट्री वहां नजर आ रही होगी तो आप कोई एनालिजी भी क्रिएट कर सकते हैं दैट कैन गिव यू मोर इनफॉर्म्ड व्यू विच विल हेल्प यू मेक मोर रैशनल एजम्शन लेटर ऑन आई होप आई आंसर योर क्वेश्चन We can see what. There is yes. one more question. Yes, yes. Uh, in the chat box, it says that how to go about the capacity utilization. There is an expansion. Again, if there is an expansion, you may not expect that your capacity utilization will increase. Your production number will grow gradually. Will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. Because capacity utilization will grow gradually. It will not increase suddenly. कंपनी ने 2022 में एक्सपेंशन की थी दो इसके प्रोडक्शन बढ़ी है मगर कैपेसिटी यूटिलाइजेशन कम हुई है तो फ्यूचर में भी आपको उसको जहन में रख के करना पड़ेगा कि आप सिर्फ कैपेसिटी यूटिलाइजेशन पे रिलाय ना करें आ, कि आपने परसेंटेज को सेम रखना है अगर तो आपकी इंस्टॉल कैपेसिटी बढ़ रही है यू शुड ग्रेजुअली इंक्रीज योर प्रोडक्शन राधर देन इंक्रीज द प्रोडक्शन एब्जी सो मूविंग ऑन टू दी स्पिनिंग पार्ट ऑफ आर रेवेन्यू फोकास्ट तो उसमें वॉट वी है राइट नाउ दैट अगेन एस बी डिस्कस अर्लियर दैट जो कंपनी की सेल्स हो रही है वो इन हाउस भी हो रही है विच इज इंटर सेगमेंटल और वो एक्सटर्नल भी कर रहा है सो फिफ्टी परसेंट इज बेसिकली कंज्यूम इंटरनली एंड फिफ्टी परसेंट सेल इन टू द मार्केट सो वॉल्यूम किस तरह फोकास्ट करेंगे अगेन द सेम अप्रोच कैपेसिटी यूटिलाइजेशन पे हो रही होगी वॉल्यूम फोकास्ट और प्राइसिस हम इसमें इस तरह से फोकास्ट करेंगे कि अगेन पहले हम रुपी में कैलकुलेट करेंगे प्राइसेस को और रुपी में चूंकि यान प्राइसेस अवेलेबल होती हैं यू कैन बेसिकली टेक दोज प्राइसेस फ्रॉम बिजनेस रिकॉर्डर और अदर पोर्टल आई विल शेयर दोज लिंक्स विद सी एफ सोसाइटी पाकिस्तान यू विल गेट दोज लिंक्स फ्रॉम द सी एफ सोसाइटी पाकिस्तान यू कैन एक्सप्लोर दोज पोर्टल पब्लिकली अवेलेबल इन्फॉर्मेशन होती है तो लोकल यान प्राइसेस आपको मिल जाएंगी हिस्टोरिकली एंड देन आप थोड़ी रिसर्च करेंगे यू विल गेट टू नो हाउ Uh, the yarn prices, you know, uh, locally uh, will increase. Similarly, again, this may be. We have to convert dollar to convert to the dollar prices. See that they are growing in which way. Because the local prices of the yarn are more or less the same uh, corridor. They move in the corridor if we compare it with the dollar prices. So again, rupee and dollar, both prices. See that in this may be we have to yarn and on that basis we will assume the growth rate. Here I have taken 0.5. की प्राइस एस्केलेशन ली है डॉलर प्राइसेस में अगेन बिकॉज स्पिनिंग सेक्टर को मैं नहीं समझता उतना ज्यादा तेजी से ग्रो करेगा एज ऑजरी सेगमेंट सो दैट्स व्हाई आई टुक अ वेरी कंजर्वेटिव अप्रोच एज फार एज द प्राइस एस्केलेशन इज कंसर्न सो आई टुक 0.5 परसेंट एज फार एज द यान प्राइस इज कंसर्न इन डॉलर टर्म्स तो एक ये चीज देखनी चाहिए एंड देन फिर आप उसको के uh, में भी कन्वर्ट कर दें सो so, You have uh, everything in pounds, uh, like rupee per pound. You need, you can convert it to rupee per dollar or dollar rupee rupee per kg or dollar per kg, uh, so that you can uh, compare it from the international market as well. Because generally, the different portals are there international level. Up on there, prices uh, dollar per kg may be quoted. 
तो आप वहां पे कंपेयर कर सकते हैं यहाँ पे जैसे फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ आई कैन शो यू तो एक पोर्टल है इसका लिंक भी आपसे शेयर कर दिया जाएगा इस पोर्टल के ऊपर यू कैन सी द कॉटन प्राइसेस और ये जो कॉटन प्राइसेस है ये डॉलर पर केजी में कोट हो रही है और आपको ही पता है कि अगर फॉर एग्जाम्पल मेरी कंट्री की डेस्टिनेशन मेरी कंपनी की डेस्टिनेशन कंट्री जो है वो नॉर्थ अमेरिका है यूरोप है तो आई कैन सी के नॉर्थ अमेरिका में किस तरह से प्राइसेस ग्रो किए हैं ओवर द इयर्स और आगे क्या फोकास नजर आ रही है हमें और इसी तरह से मेरी कंट्री मेरी कंपनी अगर यूरोपियन मार्केट में ऑपरेट करी तो वॉट काइंड ऑफ यान प्राइसेज आई कैन एज्यूम फॉर द नेक्स्ट टू ईयर्स सो दिस पोर्टल विल हेल्प यू मेक अ वेरी साउंड एजम्शन एज फार एज द यान प्राइसेज फोकास इज कंसर्न राइट Uh, so this is basically about the revenue forecast. You will get this sheet um, from the CFA Society uh, uh, Pakistan uh, after this workshop. Then you can you know have a look at it bit more in detail. And of course uh, you will come up with your own assumptions uh, based on your own rationale. But it it will help you out break down your uh, company uh, revenue uh, model uh, as far as your revenue model is concerned. So let's see if there, if there is any question quick. If there is any quick question as far as the revenue is concerned, then we'll wrap it up doing the uh, cost part of uh, cost part of it quickly in the next ten to fifteen minutes. So, if there is any question, uh, please feel free to ask. Okay, G uh, Fazan. Better if you unmute yourself and ask. It saves us time. Yes, hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, basically, uh, basically, कुछ uh, companies हैं जो uh, cotton पे तो मतलब yarn पे तो depend करती हैं, but they are also towards uh, जैसे synthetic हम बात कर लें uh, raw materials use कर रही हैं तो उन उनको उनका भी जो है वो कुछ फैक्टर इंक्लूडेड होना चाहिए आई गेस उनको कैसे ओके फेयर दैट्स अ गुड क्वेश्चन सो सो सिंस वी आर डन विद द रेवेन्यू फोरकास्ट एज यू मेंशन द सिंथेटिक पार्ट ऑफ द मैन्युफैक्चरिंग प्रोसेस ऑफ यान मे कम इनटू योर एज पार्ट ऑफ योर रॉ मटेरियल मे बी दैट मे नॉट बी योर फिनिश्ड गुड राइट सो यू आर सेलिंग यान एंड ऑजरी एज योर फिनिश्ड गुड्स इनटू द मार्केट सो as part of your revenue forecast is concerned you may not be focused that much on your uh, on the on the raw material side of it you will focus on the uh, on the price of the finished goods of of your company which is hosri and yarn in our case uh, so the uh, so the point you mentioned may come uh, up when we forecast the raw material of our company again so if your company is uh, manufacturing yarn and hosri Uh, there are two major components of uh, two major components of the raw material again as part of cost of goods sold again the raw material is the major component and in the raw material we have two more uh, uh, big segment one is the raw material yarn which is uh, the raw material for hosri and the raw material as cotton which is in fact the raw material for yarn itself so for the in order to forecast uh, Uh, the the cotton uh, requirement uh, to manufacture yarn uh, what we need to do we need to understand that how much yarn we need to produce uh, a dozen pair of socks so it is a general rule of thumb that 500 gram of uh, yarn is needed to basically uh, uh, manufacture uh, one dozen of socks right so this is this is this assumption that you can take which is uh, in, uh, which is of course general rule of thumb and with, with this assumption you can calculate the total yarn requirement uh, in your case in my case it is 22 million kg as far as uh, the kg unit is concerned <clears throat> and since i am uh, procuring uh, yarn look uh, in house as well so i you know subtract the yarn locally i mean in house available and then uh, subtract it from my total yarn requirement so from outside what i need to procure is basically 18 million kg yarn that i need to procure from the market itself it can be you know from the local market from the international market it depend from where i can get the better quality yarn at a better price 
so as far as the quantity is concerned you can you know uh, calculate uh, the, the the yarn requirement as follows as as, as we discussed uh, but for uh, the cost part of it so you know uh, in the revenue uh, section we uh, calculated the yarn prices as our finished good price uh, you can take that price as your cost as well but you took a discount but you can take a discount to it so i take a 20 20% discount because uh, after doing some trial and error uh, exercise uh, in my case for the last 5 years i came up with the assumption that company is is, is basically uh, procuring yarn from the local market or the international market at a 20% discount to the final price which they are selling their yarn in the market so this is an assumption that i took uh, in order to calculate the cost uh, of yarn per kg on per on per kg basis right and again you can you know justify uh, these numbers uh, from taking prices uh, uh, from, from the different portal uh, available publicly available information is there as far as the yarn prices so, so this is this is how you can forecast uh, the consumption of yarn and the price of yarn moving on to the other part of the raw material which is cotton again the cotton is needed to basically manufacture yarn uh, in house Uh, so again uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 yarn production you need to identify how much cotton you need so uh, there is again there is a general rule of thumb that if you are procuring uh, cotton from the local market uh, the yield that it gives you to convert cotton into yarn is 81 percent like if you take uh, uh, one kilogram of uh, cotton to, uh, locally it will give you hundred Uh, one kilogram it will give you point uh, eight uh, kilogram of yarn, and similarly, if you get one kilogram of uh, imported cotton, it will give you point nine uh, kilogram of yarn. So this is again the general rule of thumb. Uh, the yield, the yield numbers is generally accepted since the company is using both imported and local uh, cotton in the ratio of 50 50 so using these assumptions you can calculate the weighted average yield uh, of uh, the cotton that you will have if you pick your uh, from both on the local and imported market and such that you will come up with the total cotton requirement so once you have the total cotton requirement in kilogram kilogram terms uh, the only thing that you need to focus is the price of cotton again the price of cotton is available in the local market you can you know i'll share the i'll share some links uh, of portal where you can get the local cotton prices business reporter is one of them and generally the prices of cotton is quoted in pound which is 37.324 uh, which includes 37.324 uh, kgs in one pound and then you can calculate the prices on per per kg basis and see uh, Uh, how the local market prices are being uh, calculated are being uh, increased over the years and then you can forecast the local prices and similarly for the international prices you need to include certain buffer or a premium for the local uh, cotton procurement uh, which is in my case is basically uh, 20 rupees per kg as a premium for uh, local because the local uh, because the international cotton is Uh, of better quality which gives you more yield the prices of uh, international cotton is slightly on the higher side in my case company pays somewhere around 25 rupees per kg as premium to uh, the local uh, market as so a local uh, cotton uh, for uh, international cotton so i took the same assumption to calculate the international market prices and then i calculated the weighted average uh cost of uh, uh, cotton on per kg basis and then multiply this price with the uh, total cotton requirement to calculate the cost of cotton uh, to conclude my discussion for the raw material uh, again uh, 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 so, so as i mentioned earlier that as part of raw material the two costs are more important which constitute 70% of my total raw material cost in my case uh, which is the cost of cotton and the cost of yarn and the remaining is basically as is mentioned earlier by fazan if i remember his name correctly is that there are certain other costs as well uh, you know to manufacture yarn or to manufacture hosiery again you can focus on remaining 30% or 29% uh, part of your raw material but again in the interest of time 
I am not going to go that much into detail uh, to see what other raw material cost uh, constitutes of and uh, how we how we can forecast the remaining raw material cost. But since the majority cost is which is seventy percent coming from the yarn and cotton, so so here you here it is you can uh, forecast uh, the cost of yarn and cotton in your case as well. So before I move on to the last part of my session, which is to forecast the fuel and power cost in my case, I just wanted to see if there's any question from your side and if anyone wanted to ask uh, any question specific to forecast the raw material cost of, uh, of any textile mills. Please unmute yourself and ask if there's any confusion, anything you would like to discuss, particularly to this case study or maybe in, in general about, uh, the, uh, about the textile company or the spinning mill or a hosiery unit. Okay, fair enough. So moving on uh, to the last part of our discussion. So here's the uh, fuel and power. Again, I, as I said earlier that uh, what you need to do, you need to be aware of the fact that what is the sanction load uh, of the company and uh, uh, and uh, what is the running load of the company. Uh, and in my case, the running load is uh, 35 megawatt. And after having, uh, after, after knowing that the running load is uh, 35 megawatt, I can calculate uh, the number of units that the company may need for a period of entire year. And, and if I assume the company is not going to increase its running load because I do not expect any increase in capacity uh, installed for the company, therefore I assume there should not be any increase in running load. Therefore, I kept the running load at the constant level of 35 megawatt. And using this running load, I can calculate the megawatt R units, the units that the company would need uh, to fulfill its energy or electricity requirement. And these are the units that we need to uh, ensure that the company should have enough uh, generation uh, or the enough source of electricity available. And since it is also given that the solar uh, uh, so the solar capacity project of 10 megawatts is installed uh, within, uh, within the factory premises of the company, so the company will get this source of electricity for free, at least because it is in-house. And the entire CapEx has already been done pre in the previous years. And this source of electricity is completely free uh, for it. Therefore, the, the units generated uh, from the solar uh, project can be calculated using the capacity utilization factor of 17%, which is, again, a general number uh, across Pakistan. Uh, based on the solar irradiation, uh, solar insulation number. And then if we calculate the total number, we can subtract this number from the total energy requirement to calculate the net energy requirement, net of solar. And then we will see that the, the net energy requirement can be met uh, from the two sources of generation, or two sources of energy. One is grid, which is from any disco. In, in my case, which is K-electric. And uh, it, it could be any other disco in your case. And the other source of electricity is basically the gas generators. So uh, what we can assume in our case, like the grid tariff is uh, is somewhere around 37.5. And this is the revised weighted average tariff that we can take. And it is a weighted average tariff, including all other adjustments. Uh, normally we have like quarterly adjustment, fuel cost adjustments, PCAR, non-PCAR, so generally in the industry, industrial sector, the weighted average cost of uh, electricity from the grid that they get is 37 per unit. We can take this uh, assumption as part of unit uh, unit cost and the grid, it consumes 50% of the remaining electricity. So it'll take 50% and then calculate the, uh, the cost of electricity that it gets from the grid. And similarly for gas generators, uh, so there's an assumption that we should take to see what kind of uh, electricity tariff it will have if it consume uh, the gas and produce electricity from the gas uh, as a source of source of energy. So again, uh, if we want to calculate the cost of electricity, it, it, it will incur if it procure gas from uh, the grid. Uh, 
so there's a general rule of thumb that uh, the gas required for one megawatt of electricity is basically uh, 3.212 mmbtu per megawatt hour is the energy uh, requirement, is the gas requirement to generate one megawatt of, hour of electricity. And generally, the efficiency of gas generator industry wide is 35%. It can be 50% depending upon uh, the old, depending on the life of the generator itself. And using these two assumptions, we can calculate the actual gas requirement uh, for one megawatt of uh, hour of electricity. And then we know that uh, uh, the, the, the gas tariff applicable for uh, uh, for these textile units is basically 2800 per mm BTU, and these are the revised uh, LNG tariff which is applicable uh, for these tariff uh, for these uh, textile entities and this is the blended basically the tariff which is applicable uh, blended blended by blended i mean uh, the natural gas and the LNG booth so using these two assumptions we can calculate the uh, the electricity tariff uh, from this source of energy and then we can calculate the cost of LNG uh, electricity uh, in our case and such that we calculated the total cost of fuel and power uh, for fast textile bills limited so this so this is the way this is a quick way uh, to calculate uh, the fuel and power cost of uh, uh, for any textile bill we'll get this sheet you can you know have a detailed look at this on, in this excel sheet to see how you can calculate the cost of uh, fuel and power for your uh, company uh, in order to forecast the uh, you know uh, cost of fuel and power for the next five years in your case so this is it from my side as far as uh, the part two uh, of my discussion is concerned if you have any questions regarding part one or part two uh, do let me know we can have quick q a session for the next five minutes maybe we have one hand raised uh, so uh, agam kumar you can you know unmute yourself and ask Uh, sir, the question is that like we are considering in this case we are considering only two segments like yarn and the whole. So we are directly linking it. Hey, jitna bhi in house production hai yarn ka, wo puta ka puta hauls se linked hota. Lekin for the cases there, there are more than one one segments dependent on yarn. So fir hum usko kis tarah distribute kare? The case we are discussing right now, which is for fast textile mills, humne bhi assumption liye ki jo yarn ban raha hai in house. Uh, wo 50 percent use ho hai internally in house for hosiery and 50 percent uh, sell ho hai market mein. so aap ki company jis pe aap log uh, kaam kar rahe you can take the assumption accordingly to ke company use kar rahe in their own case and using that assumption uh, you can forecast and keep that assumption same for the next five years as far as there is uh, no change uh, you know, given by the company as part of their strategy. So, usko is tarah kar sakte hain. Bas ek cheez zehn mein rakhne ki zarurat hai. Wo ye hai ki jo in house yarn ko jab aap market mein sell kare hote hain, aur at the same time aap market se pick up bhi karte hain yarn, taaki aap ni house ni manufacturing mein karein. Usme kuch na kuch price differential zarur hoga. That's why you are not keeping uh, the entire in house yarn for your uh, in house consumption. Uh, generally, it happens that better pricing in the market, the demand is higher, so you sell your uh, internally produced yarn into the market to basically uh, earn uh, uh, better profits uh, for your uh, yarn segment. And when the price is down, you pick your yarn from your hosiery uh, segment at the same time. So, you have to see a little bit about it. कि वो मार्केट डायनामिक्स के हिसाब से किस तरह से क्या बेटर प्राइसिंग आपको मिल रही टू बेसिकली मैक्सिमाइज योर प्रॉफिट एट द एंड ऑफ द डे जनरली कंपनीज जो है वो कोई एक स्टेप ऑफ पैटर्न पे नहीं चल रही होती uh, लेकिन जो जनरल रूल ऑफ थंब अप्लाई किया जाता है जा वो अराउंड 50% का ही होता है बिकॉज़ इट बेसिकली इट ऑपरेट्स अक्रॉस ऑल अक्रॉस द एंटायर ईयर उसमें वो अपनी सीजनैलिटी के हिसाब से सेल और बाय कर रहे होते हैं मार्केट के अंदर तो एंड दिस फर्दर इंफॉर्मेशन यू नो यू कैन आल्सो टेक इट फ्रॉम योर इंडस्ट्री मेंटर और फैकल्टी एडवाइजर इफ दे हैव एनी 
specific knowledge uh, with regards to uh, the industry as well. Uh, but as per my understanding is concerned, uh, company ke apni strategy ke se you can make your own assumptions accordingly. I hope I answer your question uh, appropriately. So do we have any other questions from the participants? I can wait for next couple of minutes before we end the session by 6.15. Rifakat, if you have any questions, please uh, ask. You may unmute, unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, sir, the question is that uh, considering the previous uh, floods issues, the grid uh, of our industry and the other part of, uh, and the other uh, competing industries would have been affected like uh, floods ki se, jo growth hui thi, cotton ki wo, uh, jo hai, wo disturb hui thi. so they might be procuring it internationally so wo do teen saal uska impact unki balance sheet par income statement par hoega so do you think ke wo uh, jo impact hai wo rest of the years mein uh, fall karega or we should consider the three uh, years or two years as exceptional and we should follow the previous trend they were following. Okay. So, I have a one of events occur in history, you will not forecast in your uh, uh, in your forecasted period. So, if we flood either, for example, last year and we see that जो कॉटन की प्रोडक्शन इंपैक्ट हुई थी इसके ऐसे हमने देखा कि कॉटन मिल्स इंपोर्ट भी की हैं ज्यादातर स्पिनिंग मिल्स ने तो दैट वाज बेसिकली अ वन ऑफ अ कैटास्ट्रोफिक इवेंट व्हिच वी व्हिच वी मे नॉट फोरकास्ट फॉर द फ्यूचर ईयर वी डू नॉट नो व्हेन दिस इवेंट विल हैपन सो एज पार्ट ऑफ अ फोरकास्टिंग एक्सरसाइज वी जनरली डू नॉट फोरकास्ट एनी वन ऑफ इवेंट्स इन फ्यूचर as far as our forecasting is concerned. So, <clears throat> aap us particular year ko exclude karke impact calculate karenge aur phir aap ek uh, normalized income ki basis ke upar ya normalized prices ki basis ke upar apni forecast ko build kar raha honge. Jitne bhi one-off events hai, us, usko aap exclude karke dekhna hai aapne. Be it from the cost side or be it from the revenue side. Aapko ek jam jo hai, wo 2020 mein COVID ke time pe bhi dikha, dik, dik sakta hai prices ke andar the volumes can that the companies have experienced in the export companies. Mein, to that again is basically one upside that companies experience due to COVID maybe. So again, uh, revenue side, you are one of event excluded because we do not know that this one of event is going So we never uh, work on any one of events. We normally look at the normalized income. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, Javier, I think we do not have any more questions, so we can uh, end the session probably.